Assalamu alaikum, good and good evening. I'm Gulale Khan. Welcome to the ThinkFest conversation session on public sector ma performance management reforms. Thank you to ThinkFest for providing this platform for critical discussion on issues that impact us all. We all know that the main objective of any public sector performance related reforms is to, is to have improved decision making, speedier processes and enhanced efficiency within the public sector, of course, to, uh, for better service delivery to the citizens. Pakistan, unfortunately, ranks uh, within the bottom third percentile of all countries included in the World Bank's worldwide governance indicators, and this hasn't really changed much in the last 20 years. Today, we have an esteemed panel to talk about this. We have highly valued individuals amongst us because amongst them, they have 80 years of collective experience under their belts. So thank you all for taking out time. Uh, let me introduce you to Mr. Shahzad Arbab, who is Special Assistant to the Prime Minister on Establishment. Thank you, Shahzad Saab, for joining us. We have Annabel Gheri, who is the Development Director at FCDO Pakistan. And we have Tariq Bajwa, former governor of the State Bank of Pakistan and a former civil servant with a great performance record. Thank you so much for taking out time, all of you. So let's start with you, Tariq Saab. Uh, we've heard this all our lives, now more frequently than ever, that public sector managers in Pakistan don't work well and treat the job as an opportunity for, for an easy life, you know, because it's, there's job security, so it's an easy life. In your opinion, is this a factual statement or is this a cruel statement? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I, I think the truth would lie somewhere in between. Uh, to say that uh, it is not true is also, I think, not, not, uh, not correct. Uh, most civil servants today are working under this hubris or that uh, at best, they are, if, even if they don't work, at best, they're only going to be transferred. So I think that is reflective of some part, some in some some part of what you have just said. Uh, but I said it's the truth lies somewhere in between, and, and 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 it's not just an issue with the managers. I think it's an issue that permeates the entire civil service culture in Pakistan. All civil servants, at whether they're in grade four or they're grade in twenty two, would have some element of this uh, at the back of their mind. Uh, and, and this reflects in their work also. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of this uh, anecdote when at one time I had a large uh, house and there were two gardeners who were managing the lawn. And one of them was a permanent employee and the other was a temporary employee. And the permanent employee would never work. And when questioned, he said, which means that, you know, the regular employees, those who have, you know, to the regular employees, they don't work. It's only the temporary employees who are supposed to work. And he said, look, this it is his job, the temporary gardener's job to work. So this is the mindset. So as I said, it's not just the mindset of the managers. It's a mindset that we all have. But, but again, going back to my opening statement, that the truth lies somewhere in between. At the same time, we must see, we, we, we observe and we see that there are hundreds and thousands of very hardworking civil servants at all levels who go out of their way, go the extra mile to perform their uh, their job and duties. Uh, I think in, in, like any other large organization, there are there are three distinct groups uh, in, in the bureaucracy or the civil service also. Uh, there are those who will perform under any circumstances. You know, you, you give them the most difficult circumstances, most trying circumstances, uh, they'll work. And they'll work whether they are being recognized or not, because it is in them. They're, it's, it's a, they have a work, strong work ethic and, and, and they have a high self-esteem and they don't want people to think poorly of them. And therefore, they'll continue to work under any circumstance. And then there are those who will not work under any circumstances. So, you know, that's the, that those are the two extremes that we have. But then there's a large bulk in the middle which will work only if there is a conducive environment there. Now, it is the job of the government, I think, to provide, or and, and not just the government. I think it's the job of the, and, and, and the government is like an amorphous term. You can anything, you can put anything under that as government, but it's, it's, it's also the job of the office manager to ensure that you provide them that conducive environment in which they can work. A secretary of the government, whether in the provincial government or the federal government, a deputy commissioner in the field level, 
critical uh, pivotal position that they have and they can of course also uh, ensure that their team is working and delivering now what we need to do is as i said you have to create that conducive environment in which people work now how do you do that i think the, the, the one of the critical elements is you hold them accountable you hold them accountable uh, not only for the decisions that they have taken but also the, the decisions that they do not take you know in pakistan the entire accountability is on the basis of malfeasance you do something it goes wrong you are held accountable what about misfeasance you're not taking you know not taking decisions in time you're not delivering the services that your your office is supposed to deliver so that is a, that's a key missing element in pakistan that you know the entire accountability is on basis of malfeasance and and, and on misfeasance of not doing anything they, they, nobody would ever ask you or even if they ask you that you you can come up with any number of excuses and it does not impinge upon your promotion or or other issues at best you might be moved from one assignment to another now that's you know that 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 accountability must lead to either reward or punishment it must lead to whether you have a you, you are promoted you are given key assignments or choice positions or you are relegated to a to a, to a group of officers who are who are thought to be uh, second rate or third raters now that that again is also something that we need to ensure that that is part of our system uh, i think that's another reason why we see this this hubris among our uh, i'm i'm not commenting on the recent system that uh, shahzad has introduced uh, incidentally we are we are both friends and and batchmates also so we go back a long time uh, i'm i'm not commenting on that i wish him luck i you know a little feedback i've been giving him that but but that, that there is certainly there is something that we need in that direction and i hope every success to him now if you if you come to why is it that uh, the, the people are not working why is this that there is uh, misfeasance i think one of the major re reasons is or or a convenient uh, scapegoat or or a fall guy is the nab uh, which is yeah, which is true also mm -hmm. uh the national accountability bureau if you do something uh you will be hauled up before that the only hindsight can be 2020 decisions have to be taken in a certain environment on a certain in in a on a certain date at a certain time and and hindsight you can always think of 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 improving that decision of doing better than what you've been able to do now nap doesn't allow you that they say no why did you do this why did you buy something at let's say 30 dollars while two weeks after that it was available at 25 dollars now you didn't have the crystal ball to see the trends the trends to certain extent yes but not to an, to an exact it's not an exact science so you of course you can make mistakes so what is happening now and particularly at the senior level is that officers are not taking those decisions and as a result of that of not taking the decisions it is it is costing the government a lot of money now in my opinion in the higher echelons of the civil service you know you you need three qualities you need apart from others you need the quality of intellectual integrity of your ability to speak up you need competence you need to have good knowledge of the subject that you have been tasked with and you need decision making ability also because in if you don't take timely decisions then you know, of course things are going to uh, go bad and it's going to it's going to create losses for the country at an at a more operational level of course you you need different qualities you need a quality of of empathy for your client which is truly the citizen of this country if you're a deputy commissioner or a district police officer you need to have that empathy you need to have that public service um and drive in you to go that extra mile in order to ensure that whatever is required to be delivered to the common citizen is actually being delivered of course you can lord over your district also uh, there are a lot of facilities you can have a good time and you can come back you can always only pander to the few political bosses and your own bosses and and then you can say all right i had i had a long term but if you if you have that empathy for your for your client and if you are willing and if you have that uh, public service try and of course you have financial integrity there at i think at the operational level financial integrity is is more important because 
uh, the, the intellectual integrity comes at a higher level. So if you have that, then there's a combination of these virtues is actually what makes you a, a, good, a good officer and is able to deliver. Now, from the citizen's perspective, the decisions that are taken by the federal government Im impacts them only indirectly. The, the decisions that are being taken at the operational level, at the level of the district or the level of the of the of the division, or a, uh, that is going to impact them directly. So, for him, it is probably it is more important that the delivery uh, mechanism has accountability built into it at the level of the of the uh, of, of the district or of the operational level. Now, another shortcoming of the uh, of our civil service is it's a very structured system. Uh, the day that you join the civil service, you are assigned a certain seniority. That seniority continues unless you are superseded. Now, up to grade 19, all promotions are based on seniority. So merit does not come in. Beyond that is, of course, it's merit comes seniority. But the, even there, seniority continues to be a critical factor. Now, in our system, that's also a saving grace in a, man, in a manner, because if if it was not so, then the likes and dislikes will become the deciding factor. But we must now have, we have, we have to balance it with the performance also. And for, therefore, in order to do that balancing, performance evaluation is critical. As they say in the management, you only get delivered what, you know, what can be measured. So you, we need to have that performance measurement tools at available, not only with the federal government, but also with the provisional government at all levels, so that they are we are able to measure the performance of our uh, of our uh, of our colleagues uh, who are now in service, whether at a senior level or at a junior level. So these are some of my thoughts. I think as we go continue, uh, we will 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 we can uh, have a more in depth discussion on some aspects of uh, my opening remarks. Yeah, thank you, Bajwa sir, because you've summarized quite a few of the challenges that, um, of course, our Bab sir and his team might be facing because they have come up with this performance management uh, system and performance management contracts for the civil service. And this is one of the key institutional reforms under this government. So, Bab sir, my question to you is that, uh, you know, what has been success like on these, the, what you've been doing on these reforms so far, because as Bajwas have said, that this is not something very easy to do. And of course, there are too many obstacles to deal with. Um, I, you see, the performance, uh, performance agreement is part of the overall performance management system. So I will confine my discussion um, on uh, the performance agreements, uh, which um, in a way, I'm spearheading in the federal government. I think the successes, um, we have quite a few successes. Um, the first is, I think, the realization at the highest level, at the cabinet level, uh, that, we, when we, that, that we commit to initiatives um, and commit to deliver those initiatives in a time, in a timeline. Um, and that Tariq would agree with me that it has been, is and has been an issue in, especially in the federal government. Federal government has its own pace. It's had its own processes for, I mean, for, for good, for good or bad reasons. Um, and confining them or sort of uh, forcing them to a certain timeline, uh, you need a lot of, uh, you need a lot of pushing and a lot of monitoring, frankly. Um, I will talk about this later on uh, as to uh, how much we have been successful in this um, in this in this process. Um, secondly, is I think this system has um, the federal government normally works in silos. The divisions work in silos. I think we have to a large extent to a large extent uh, been successful in breaking these silos um, through this system because. Um, Later on, I'll also sort of uh, elaborate on this as to how have we sort of succeeded in that. Uh, thirdly, is that we have tried to sort of move on from a culture of processes uh, to a culture of, um, let's say, um, outcomes. Basically, um, we have a lot of processes in the in the federal bureaucracy, um, but. Um, very little attention is given to actually the outcomes. So 
that's what we have tried to bring in in the in the system of performance um, agreements uh, and thirdly the quarterly reviews that we have uh, very regularly uh, and it's uh, a very intense and extensive uh, exercise that we carry out with each and every uh, division uh, and that we um, i think we have been successful to an extent uh, where we have um, resolved um, issues or dependencies which in a, which again is in a serious um, uh, a serious constraint uh, in the federal government when we talk of inter ministerial correspondence um, that's an open ended thing i mean uh, this correspondence can can take take place in a week it can also take months sometimes even years uh, and i'll i can even quote you with examples where a opinion from a ministry has taken more than a year so this system basically uh, captures that process and um, has been and has been to 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 an extent um, helpful in sort of uh, uh, clearing those dependencies through this uh, quarterly quarterly monitoring um, where we bring in the concerned um, ministries along with the ministries on, on whose the initiatives are dependent and and lastly i think um, is the uh, uh, it's it's a, i think it's a handy governance tool with the with the government and with the prime minister um, and the more the prime minister takes interest in this uh, in this process i think the man, the more he is hands on on the uh, on, on what is happening in different ministries and obviously it it uh, it has hastens the process of uh, of uh, of decision making at the at the ministerial level so these are i think the the, the five successes that i think uh, has happened um we will discuss it um, further um on what we have been doing uh, as i mean this is this has been a long process frankly we started this almost 2 years ago and in the process um we have learned and uh, we have made uh, improvements to the system which i will elaborate in the uh, as we go on the dependencies which is again the processes that slow down a certain intervention is something of a, a big success because that's where a lot of people complain that you know sarkar mein the kaam jo rok jata hai so probably this is something really important and of course all those uh, the fact that there is a realization now at the very top about these reforms and these contracts being extremely important and something that they have to adhere to anabel uh, from the S, uh, fcdo perspective i want to ask you because you've been working in a lot of different countries as well and um, fcdo supports various institutional and technical assistance reforms in pakistan so uh, before we move to pakistan i just wanted to know are there any learnings from similar reforms in other countries that can mean good news for us you know something that can encourage us thank you yeah, it's a really a really um, interesting question so and both of the previous panelists actually have spoken about leadership and i think that's a very good place to start because if i look around and see the reforms that i've been involved in if you haven't got leadership you have got a problem big time in in public service um reform so i think this is something which you definitely have got going for you now in pakistan and you know a clear um political commitment to actually making a difference to citizens and i think particularly the first speaker spoke about that about actually if we're in public service ultimately this is about citizens so i think that kind of leadership and that that drive um to to what's the sort of tangible difference is making is really important and i mean lots of different examples i could draw on so i'll just sort of dot around a few of them i think i think another one which is really promising here and and has changed certainly over my career and will have changed over the career of the other panelists is is digital digital and data and our ability to use data um much more effectively for decision making for transparency for accountability and i can see that in some of the president's office kind of reforms the way of thinking uh, definitely using data so i think that that is that gives us reasons to be hopeful and to be cheerful and you know even when i think of the more analog kind of use of data that i've been involved in the past 
it's undoubtedly true that when you have data either that is looking um, on its own merits at performance in a public sector, then I can think of one of the African countries I worked in, a kind of annual state of the public service, which then you could just compare year to year at the broad level, uh, what are the reforms and um, what, what are the challenges. I think um, where it becomes even more so, and I think there is this is some of the thinking in the performance management agreements, is where you actually get a little bit of healthy competition going. So you have data comparing different parts of government. Now we don't like this, I'm a public servant, we, we don't like it. We like it when we're at the top of the league, we don't like it when we're not at the top of the league, but it's actually really good for us, uh, this kind of transparency and accountability. So I think that's also something we should look at. And I've seen certainly in one of the African countries I worked in where there was deliberate competition between subnational authorities and other federal system, looking at the, all the states in that, in that particular country, 36 of them, and they had to compete against a certain range of public sector reform criteria. And if the highest ranking got more financing, um, and that can get you out of a rather unhelpful loop where um, census data and people inflating that, you know, then gives you your public financing. So, of course, you will have a formula and different elements, but actually thinking about how do you reward and incentivize good performance using data. And I think increasing examples of that are promising, have worked in less um, advanced contexts than Pakistan, less capable and have made a real difference. Um, and then the other area I think that's really important, which I touched on at the beginning of my comments, is around making making this real for outcomes. So this cannot be around process improvement. I think a lot of the reforms that I was involved in sort of earlier on in my career were around process in improvement. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be saying process for what um, before you're actually going to be doing things that are really going to make a difference and are going to keep that leadership commitment because your leaders want to see things making a difference. And it's expensive to sort of sustain reforms. So you have to show how it can make a difference and also how it can make you savings. And again, you know, I can think of things and perhaps some of these performance uh, management targets and thinking that's come to Pakistan now, perhaps we can go down into that a bit more now and say, well, what are the process improvements that, that will lead to outcomes that will affect a citizen experience? So I can think of things, I'll give you a very simple example of hospitals and how do hospitals triage and manage patients when they turn up at the point of service delivery? And if you get some clever analysis of what are the bottlenecks, how do people jump the queue, how are people paying before their turn, all the things that can go wrong if you're just in a queue, and some very simple things, and in the case I'm thinking of, what they did was provided a proper queuing area, provided a very low-tech ticketing, and there were various steps and various breaking down to different tasks, which meant that actually people got seen in the right order, paid the right price, uh, got seen by the right person. It wasn't very... Uh, complicated, but it just needed somebody to think about the outcome and about the uh, person receiving the service. So having that mindset and showing you can make a difference by having that mindset, I think, is is incredibly powerful. And there's definitely the potential to do that there. I think the last thing I'll say um, before I'm quiet for now is about uh, sticking with it over time. And this, this is a, an obvious point, but it's also not an obvious point, because I think everyone involved in public sector reform, you're painfully aware of the political cycle and what stage of the political cycle you're at. And for the difficult reforms, those need to come at the right time in the political cycle, because otherwise you're not going to get that sustained investment, um, you know, through the next political electoral cycle. So I think really setting things up to, to have your early wins and then to be able to sustain that over time um, is absolutely absolutely essential. And certainly, you know, if I think of successful reforms that I've been involved in at a point, you know, you're looking at 10, 15 years periods. And it's it's almost like, I was going to say it's like organized crime, but um, you know, new things come up all the time. But I think the point is change is constant and the challenges are constant. Uh, but if we want to be successful, we need to keep on learning and, and, and stick with it. This is not something that's going to be fixed overnight. So having our successes along the way, but sticking at it. Um, now, I hope that that, is, that uh, scenario is there for Pakistan, but I recognise that's really challenging. And I think everyone involved in, in public sector reform, thinking about how we're going to keep that interest and that commitment is, is really essential for our licence to continue um, reforming. 
Yeah, thank you for this, because this does, uh, the uh, three areas that you pointed out, the political ownership and leadership data, and again, not processes, but outcomes and results uh, are important. But um, Tariq Sab, I come to you at this point in the conversation, because we all understand that even though we'll talk about results, we'll talk about, you know, what are the outcomes, but we also know that unlike the private sector, um, tracking performance management in public sector is very tricky and uh, political affiliations are there various other issues creep in you know we you cannot just separate the politics from the work that you're doing so how do you feel this overall culture of the government has to change or has to be reformed to institutionalize and embed performance based systems okay. thank you well, I can I can think of many many things for which I I can blame the politicians, but for one thing that I think I can I, I can't blame the politicians is the performance evaluation system. The performance evaluation evaluation system is intrinsic to an organization. Uh, in my 38 hours of public service, uh, I have not had any occasion when I was asked to change my evaluation of my team or of one of the team members. This is this is absolutely left to me, and it was the culture of that organization which actually weighed more upon me than anything that a that a politician or a minister would have would say. It is it's very it's, it's very internal, it's very intrinsic uh, within an organization, and unfortunately, I think we as civil servants and as senior civil servants are to be blamed for that. It's not the politicians who are to be blamed for that. Now there was this. Um, there, there, somebody had done this analysis in the establishment debate, and they come up with this number, which said that around 93 or 94 percent of all evaluations were either very good or excellent. Now, if 93, 94 percent of all evaluations are very good or excellent, then a very good is the average. But unfortunately, that's not what we are seeing. What we are what we are not witnessing when we look at the results. You know, I'm reminded of my nephew, you know, in, when he was in class eight or nine, he got average grades. So his father one day in the after dinner said, look, we have to talk uh, about your results. He said, yes, what is, what is, what do we have to talk? And his father said, there are, you know, you have just got average numbers. He said, look, but that's what most people are, average. So, you know, so it, it, and if you have 94%, very good, excellent, then there's something wrong. And we are responsible for that. You know, we as, as former civil servants are responsible for that. So in the, the evaluation is always warped. You give somebody an average ACR, he'll, he'll think that you've given him some adverse comments. You give him a good ACR, he'll try to influence you through within the system to say, all right, look, no, I was, I'm an excellent officer. I'm very good. Some so-and-so got a very good, so and got an excellent. So why am I being deprived of that? Now, on the basis of this performance evaluation, then we go have our promotion boards. We have the Central Selection Board, and I had the privilege of being part of the Central Selection Board for a couple of years. At that time, uh, you know, Shahzad was also there. And from own, my, my own experience, there was, there was a senator and there was a member of the National Assembly who were also members of that Central Selection Board. But because by and large, the civil servants who were there and who were about eight or 10 of us, because we were focusing on merit alone. I don't remember either one of them even speaking, saying a word which went against the merit of that officer. And after the, you know, it's a, it's a three-day process. On the second day, they, they didn't even come. They didn't even turn up. So, you know, we'll, we cannot blame the politicians for that also. The Central Selection Board completely independent does it, and, and therefore we are able to uh, work on it. Now, what we can blame the politician than the government of the day is, is the frequent transfers and postings that are happening. That is counterproductive for the government itself. You know, unless you have a full term of three years or two years, whatever you whatever you decide, you cannot expect Shadad, the outcomes that you, you that you expect. Even Einstein would take come if you transfer him to the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Interior or Ministry of Health will take about a few months to settle down and understand those issues. And then only over a period of time would be able to deliver. Now, if there we are frequently changing our officers at the top, there is no continuity. 
that, and who, who do you hold responsible for not being able to 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 meet those targets that you have been set so therefore i think it is in the interest of the politicians and of, especially of the government at a setting to ensure that there is there is the sanctity of term of tenure if you are able to do that then i think that that's the job of the government otherwise the evaluation within the existing system is our responsibility and that culture has to change to, from within so when we were at the central selection board there's a there's a social cost that you have to be to pay in if you are fair so that you remember when you know people your friends and your relatives they go against you say look you were there and you didn't get me promoted and we said we only wanted to be fair but you pay that cost and you you must be willing to do that otherwise everybody scratching each other's back and and then there everybody gets promoted so but that's that's our job the job of the government is to ensure that there is a they they have an absolute free hand they can select anyone that they want to but once he has been selected they must give him that respective term they can of course set him you know mid course milestones can be set if you don't do this 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 within a 6 months or a 12 months period then you will only be shifted here people are people are being shifted at whims and and unfortunately what is further eroding the culture of the, the the merit culture or the competence culture of the civil services that in the provinces it is now commonly being heard that people are actually paying money to get cushy assignments or key assignments so that sounds like a death knell to anything that you want to any system that you want to build of of merit of competency leading to accountability so i think that that is the part where the politician and the government comes in the evaluation part of it is our responsibility we must inculcate these values in our in our civil servants that they can rise above their own relationships likes dislikes and do a fair evaluation and when they're sitting on the board there also they are able to come up and 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 and, and take the scenes based on merit uh well has other parts is and especially when you're looking at the contract part of it you know it's a specific system that you're looking at the performance management contract so is everybody excellent and 100% good in the contracts and the quarterly evaluations that you do we would want to know more about this system particularly how it was set up and how does it evaluate all these um, you know ministries and again something that tarik sir pointed out at the moment somebody starts to understand the work they transfer so how does that impact the contract that you sign with them or the prime minister signs with a specific ministry or is it you know beyond that and it happens and i mean just something more detail on the system that has been set up well as far as the uh, as far as tarik's uh, point of view is concerned uh, regarding the transfers i couldn't agree uh, more uh, with him i agree that if you have to uh, if you have to deliver you need to give time to the incumbent to deliver and at least be there for for a couple of years um, in in that position that i agree um but let me just clarify the the contract is made by the prime minister with the ministers uh which means that then it has to trickle down to the secretary and down below uh to the to the additional secretaries and joint secretaries and the attached departments so is basically the minister who the prime minister holds responsible um you see the the, the system as it evolved um we started with a, a pilot phase of uh, 11 ministries back in 2019 20 uh, that was when the 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 cabinet approved uh, the pilot phase in back in september 2019 uh, i think that was a good learning uh, uh learning curve for us uh from there uh once we um, we completed the first phase of uh, two quarters um then we went back to the cabinet with the lessons learned uh, in the in the pilot phase and the cabinet then uh took interest in this uh, in the system and it uh, it was decided that it should be rolled out to all the all the 40 divisions 40 or 40 no 41 divisions so uh, the first when we started actually uh, it was just like the fbr and uh, um, tarek has been uh, chief of the fbr we wanted to bring in um, all the 
all the all the all the secretaries and all the ministers into the system. Uh, we were not very, let's say, not very. We didn't we didn't push uh, the ministers or the secretaries in the first year uh, because we wanted them to own the system. Uh, they came up with their initiatives, uh, and then we sat down with them. We have we have a we made, we made a peer review committee, which is. Uh, which we have uh, the deputy chairman planning commission and uh, senior officers from cabinet planning, uh, finance and establishment. And I sit with them and we review basically their, uh, their, their agreements and their targets. Um, so then we agree on, um, uh, on, the, on, on the targets, on the initiatives, et cetera. But to be honest, in the first year, um, we were not very ambitious. We wanted the system to sort of uh, creep in and creep in. Um, but this time, and uh, now, um, the, the first review, uh, we have, we have completed the review of the, of, of the year, uh, the, the last year. And, uh, let me also share with you that, <clears throat> uh, I would say that initially, uh, our, uh, ministers and our secretaries, um, I think everybody took it mostly a, a little easy because, Normally in Pakistan, when you start a new process, um, it in most cases either fizzles out, fizzles, it, it fizzles out, or, or it it's, it's fades away in, during uh, with the with the passage of time. Uh, but I think we this time we were quite consistent because I thought that this probably is a very effective tool if we have to implement certain certain initiatives, certain reforms that the prime minister is interested. in. So only two weeks ago, we went to the prime minister and we went and gave them a, present, a, a, a briefing on the, on the ranking of uh, the different ministries. And the prime minister said that I would like to call all those uh, ministries whose performance have not been, um, have, have not been that good, let's say. Uh, so he did call those, um, those ministers where the performance was, let's say, below a certain percent percentage and uh, this was i think quite surprising something something very new uh, which normally doesn't happen in our political system um so that gave a very very strong message basically to the ministers and also to the to the ministries basically that there is a an element of accountability if you're giving giving a, a time frame for a certain initiative to be delivered you have to deliver that and that's why our 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 strategy was that we will not interfere in what the ministries are suggesting right we will only we will only sort of discuss with them basically the timelines um, so the initiative is that of the minister and the secretary and the quarterly targets are also set by them so they have to basically deliver because it's 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 their initiative um, and on those timelines and initiatives, the prime minister will hold them responsible or accountable. And that's what we are trying to do. Uh, as I said, in the last, uh, last week, this has happened. The prime ministers did call these ministers and had a, a, a discussion with them, gave them all the, the performance that uh, we had provided to, uh, to the prime minister. I think it has had a very, very uh, good impact on, um, on the ministries. Now, for the next two years, we are going to sort of uh, um, have a, an agreement now for two years. It will sort of, because we want to sort of reconcile it with the tenure of the, of the government. The prime minister or the government should know that by the end of two years, when their term will finish, what, 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 is, what is it that they're going to sort of uh, achieve or sell to the, to the people basically. The, the, main, the main focus obviously uh, as was earlier pointed out, is basically the citizen and the people. So um, this year is going to be a two-year two year agreement. We have had that process completed. We we had a very very long lengthy discussions on uh, on the on the agreements. This time, I think we were more uh, we were more ambitious uh, because as as I said, we have learned uh, through the, the, the through the process. And um, I, I, I can sort of uh, very gladly say uh, that this time the agreements are, um, are 
are really good agreements, frankly. Um, uh, and uh, the targets are quite, in most cases, they are, um, they are, they are reasonable and to an extent ambitious as well. So um, the second thing that we have done is that when initially we started, it was all manual. Now it is all digitized. We have a portal where uh, the ministries can 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 put their uh, their performance um, on a daily basis. Uh, we have focal persons from each uh, each ministries, and we have our own team in the in the PM office who sort of uh, interact with them. So even the dependencies, um, as as I said, we are improving. Uh, one of one of the things that we uh, are already the the, the our, uh, technical people are, are sort of um, uh, working on it, that all the depends, dependencies, um, there will be a warning in the system that will go to the concerned uh, ministry that this is the dependencies which is spending with you. Uh, secondly, we are also introducing a monthly meeting to resolve dependencies uh, of the ministries because that I think is crucial in uh, completing an initiative or a target. Um, so, so as I said, we are we are learning, uh, and we are also improving uh, as we go along. So hopefully, um, this time, as the Prime Minister has already told the ministers, that there will be a quarterly review by him of all those ministries who have not, let's say, who have not met their uh, their their targets to a certain extent. So the Prime Minister will have a meeting with all those uh, those ministers and secretaries. I think that is going to. Uh, help and he's, he he also mentioned this that if there are issues with the ministries or the secretaries, the prime minister office will resolve those issues. They will try to resolve those issues. So, and additionally, we are also the finance minister, in fact, um, who is also a, a, I think a great supporter of the system uh, coming from the private sector. Uh, we are also working on a on a on a, on a system of reward. Basically, we always talk of. Uh, of punishment, but I think um, we should also incentivize the system. So hopefully, in the next um, few weeks, we will come up with a with a process where those ministries who perform well will be given a substantial uh, financial incentive. Inshallah. Yeah, that's interesting because a you mentioned about a point which Annabel mentioned at the beginning that political leadership and its ownership is very important. So we see that happening now for this uh, particular task that you are doing, and of course the reward system because we are seeing a lot of comments now and people are saying that oh if you increase the salaries of these uh, bureaucrats probably they'll work harder or oh, if you do this they'll work harder. But of course that's something for you to decide. But there's uh, something that I want uh, to ask Annabel before we can go to the questions um, by most of the people who are watching us right now. Annabel, uh, a lot of people say that we do see a lot of investment in institutional reforms because this is one of the best ways to improve the working of Pakistan's public sector. And by improving the, uh, like, you know, a reform which improves the working of the public sector, it actually means that the citizens benefit as well. So I was just wondering if you see, like, as a development practitioner, do you see that this work on reform bear, is bearing fruit to modernize Pakistan public sector and improve performance? And how can you help more? And you know what's the successes that you would like to talk about, and you actually want to aim for? Thank you. Yes. So I, mean, I just I won't say too much about it because it'd be good to get on to questions. But um, I think where technical assistance to government here or elsewhere on institutional forms is most valuable as if it's additional. What it should not be doing is putting a space which actually the public service of the country concerned could do itself, but for some reason due to performance deficits or you know there aren't people haven't been posted, uh, it's not being done. So that's really important is a good negotiation up front in terms of how is this going to provide additionality and allow um, through this partnership to do something you wouldn't have done. So that takes you normally, I think, in effective areas into areas of um, innovation and um, taking some risks, actually, because I think this is something else that hasn't really come up in the conversation so far. But generally, public services, for good reasons, are wary about taking on too much risk. But if you don't take risk, you're probably not moving forward in terms of innovating and, and learning. 
as much as you could be. So using your um, external assistance to help you experiment, innovate, take a bit more risk and learn from that is incredibly important. Um, and you know, I think examples at the moment, I can think of various things. Um, one of our programmes called the Subnational Governance Programme has got an innovation window working with governments subnationally in Lahore and for Punjab and in um, Peshawar for Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And there, there's a, this window has, in both cases, done some things on tax, quite technical things, but using, using um, digital, for example, in um, Lahore to map um, properties and then cross-checking that against the data that government held already to see what proportion of properties are just entirely slipping through the tax net. It wasn't a very expensive intervention. It was a little bit experimental. It needed some resource that the, the government would not have had. Um, but if they if they had it as extra, they were quickly able to do this and demonstrate a very simple, cost-effective, cheap way of finding a lot more people who are not paying tax and to get them into the tax net. Um, that's one example. I think uh, policy as well. Sometimes it's easier if to use that technical assistance to bring fresh eyes and a, a fresh perspective and ask some of the some of the questions which people inside the system perhaps just don't see anymore or don't ask anymore. But partnering alongside those people in terms of ans asking those questions and, and coming up with solutions. And I think we certainly saw again the same program actually. Um, in the response to COVID last year, having a little bit of extra resource to help um, the public um, sector, um, the sort of centre of government functions, planning, finance, think about what has COVID done um, to our budgets, to our skills, the capability offer, to how we're responding to citizens, and then um, helping the sort of, to, to summarise what are the policy changes there and just standing with the public se um, servants and, and coming behind them and helping them respond more quickly to events. So that's the sort of range of the kind of the kind of things um, that can be incredibly effective. And, you know, certainly as an outsider, you know, there are some I want to say this to all of the people watching. There are some, you, you know, people see the bad. They tend to see the bad and they know about the sort of cases and the things that go wrong. But actually, you know, you have got some incredibly talented motivated impressive people in the public service here um so those are the people you know that we need to get behind um and to support and um, when they've got political backing um you know can make a fantastic um, difference to citizens yeah thank you annabelle i think the motivated ones are the brand ambassadors for what shazad saab is doing so probably a campaign for them but um annabelle you pointed out to the fact that um you know, uh, the innovative approach and the risk taking approach is now very important. Uh, so that's something that, of course, can be looked into, especially when it comes to reform, because traditionally we've seen that things are just happening and their processes and processes and processes and you don't see results. Uh, so now um, we have several questions and I can see two very specific questions that Tarek Saab can answer and two for Shahzad Saab and Annabelle as well. But let's let's start with the uh, question on um something like you know the salaries are very low so why can't you make them equal to the private sector that will be incentive enough that example do you actually think that imp improve you know increasing salaries uh and perks is actually going to help uh, certainly it is going to help I think it is it's very clear uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a, a very critical important factor um Paying a living wage to a civil servant is very important. Um, and this is not just Pakistan. Uh, I think there's, there was this, uh, there's a lot of documentation on the Hong Kong police. The Hong Kong police in the 1960s was in the control of the triads, uh, which is the uh, organized crime, and uh, was very corrupt. So there was a Queen's Commission which was established to look into that. And they said one of the reasons, critical reasons, was that, yes, there were salaries were low. So they increased the salaries in, in quantum, there was a quantum jump in the salaries in one go. And then in the later years of the uh, of, of the British rule there, they became, Hong Kong police became a, a, one of the cleanest police forces in that region. So yes, that's, that's very important. Now, specifically into Pakistan, uh, there have been numerous studies which says that uh, if you look at our uh, non-gadgeted uh, officials, that is from BS1 to BS16, 
the salaries that have been given to them are actually a little higher than what is being given on a com comparable basis to the private sector. Secondly, uh, it's also you know where it's, it's also a chicken and egg story. Where are we going to get the resources from? When I was the Secretary of Finance in the government of Punjab, uh, the the Punjab government had roughly eight hundred thousand employees, which means that. Uh, even if there was an increase of one rupee in the salary of that employees, that had a result of 10 million rupees annually. Now, if you want to make a meaningful increase, that has to be at least 10,000, 20,000, over 100,000 rupees more. Where are you going to get the resources from? And of course, unless you have an excellent civil service, uh, the resources are not going to increase. So what a different stage, different interventions have been made. For example, in the FBR, an intervention was made that all that that's special employees or specific employees of FBR was given an additional salary on top of the regular salary. The judiciary has been given two additional salaries in addition to their salary. Now, it is important to see whether it has made the necessary impact or not. My own observation is it has not. Why? Because these incentives were given across the board. They were not performance related incentives. So what we need to do is, and, and of course, because we are resource shy also, so we need to lim link it with performance. Only those who are performing well, who meet those, whatever are the uh, benchmarks or whatever the outcomes or the outputs, whatever you may agree with that. Only those officers then should be incentivized. Because if you start giving an incentive across the board, it actually is, ends up being no incentive. Quite a interesting answer, and yes, a very practical one as well. But let's see what that can be done about it. Uh, there's so many questions, but I think Annabel, there's a question specifically for you that in the UK there's a civil service fast stream. So do you recommend that for Pakistan? <laughs> I like the question. I think the way you already have your own civil service fast stream, um, alumni of which are my fellow panelists here who have. <laughs> entered you know public service by a very um you know demanding route and have been through a, a in-depth um very thorough training together that's taken them through all different aspects of public service and then have as a cadre you know moved moved through so oh. i think in a way you already have it i would say what i think would be very worth considering is different types of entry because you get a certain type of of public servant who comes in through those fast streams they will have those generalist skills you can turn their hands to many different jobs but increasingly as um, the role of government becomes less doing i think over time and more enabling the private sector more enabling other kinds of partners um, you do need different types of skills, different types of professions, different types of expertise. So I think there's a real place for looking at where are your sort of skills gaps within government and different schemes to get young professionals in from the private sector, from academia, depending on what your need is at the time. And I mean, to make that concrete, when I joined um, the British government, I was a lawyer. I, I was a newly qualified lawyer. I've been practicing for a few years uh, in London and I joined government on a Scream, uh, uh, scheme for young professionals and I was the first lawyer to join the Department for International Development as a technical advisor in law. Um, my salary was less than half what I'd been earning before but I was excited at the possibility to influence policy have a bigger impact so I think we need to think about different types of schemes and how you can attract bright people with the skills that you need in and not just one kind of um, civil service fast track entry type of, of offer. Yeah, that's interesting because you said that you were really excited about the prospect of actually working for something which can have more impact policy wise and also benefit the public. So Arbapsa, there is a question uh, by one of the viewers is that a lot of good civil servants and Tariq Saab also pointed this out, they feel very demotivated, either they don't want to work or they're, they, you know, they're scared to work. So with the particular work that you're doing, what are you doing to create excitement and motivation? Because probably that's the first step for them to start looking towards the targets that you've set for them. And there is another question which is linked to this, that how are you uh, trying to, or how is this government, you know, trying to put a stop to political motivated postings and transfers? That's also something that has come up. 
Well, uh, so, uh, since we were elaborated by Tariq in his uh, earlier, um, earlier discussion um, about why officers are uh, shy in taking decisions, and I need not sort of uh, repeat those. Uh, for officers um, uh, to shy away from decisions, but but let me let me be a little uh, more uh, frank and candid. Um, you see, yes, uh, NAB is uh, is a factor, but how many? I mean, how many instances can one can one quote? There will be very few. There are some, yes, where a a, 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 an honest or a, a, a good professional um, has been sort of uh, brought on the yes, brought on the radar of uh, radar of uh, NAB, yes. But how many of those officers uh, have been really punished by by NAB? I think there are very very few. Uh, so the good officers, the professional officers, uh, when they take decisions, I think um, in 95% cases, I think, uh, nothing is going to happen to them. Um, and there are examples. Uh, I mean, Tarek is one of the examples. He has been you know, on very important uh, assignments, positions, and has been taking decisions. But I agree that is, uh, that is one of the, one of the factors. Um, I mean, it's easier, frankly, in a way, you can sort of put some, uh, uh, make somebody responsible, yes. Uh, uh, so I think one of the, how do you make uh, officers work? Um, one is obviously to incentivize uh, their work. And secondly, as we all, always say, there has to be some accountability. Accountability within the system, not from, not an external accountability, but an internal accountability. Um, now what we have, uh, the new uh, directory retirement, retirement rules, uh, if you must have heard about that, uh, is also a, an attempt to let's say weed out those those officers who who just do, do not want to work. For example, as was mentioned earlier, we have been punishing people for uh, taking decisions, but we have not been punishing people for not taking decisions. And I think this retire, the, uh, the direct retirement rules is one of the the instruments through which we should be able to at least weed out uh, weed out some of those officers uh, who just do not do not uh, who. Who are not required, let's say, or, or who are not interested. Uh, you see, in in in, in Pakistan, or in our civil service, I have yet to come even one instance, I think, where an officer uh, has been removed from service throughout his career for, let's say, being uh, being incompetent. Um, officers have been removed for misconduct, etc. But I think there will be very very few examples of officers being removed on incompetence. So I think we need to sort of uh, uh, incentivize, yes, uh, the, the service. Uh, I'm absolutely for it. And there are there are discrepancies even within the federal government between different, uh, different divisions. I think we need to sort of uh, bridge that gap. And that effort has been made in the last budget where a 25%, uh, 25 I think, increase was given uh, to only those divisions where the, the 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 salary was uh, relatively less um, in the federal government. There are some divisions where, which are getting a lot of bonuses and uh, allowances. Where are where are, and every every officer wants to move to those divisions, um, while there are other ministries who work as hard as the others, but their 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 uh, salary salary or the entire compensation is less because they don't have those extra allowances. So we, I think, the first step has been taken, uh, um, and and the, the the government obviously is uh, is cognizant of this fact. There's also a differential between the 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 allowance or the the, the take-home salary of a provincial officer and a federal officer. Um, in provinces, uh, the salary or uh, plus the, the bonuses or the allowances are much higher than the one that the, the, the civil servants in the federal government get. So we need to sort of bridge those gaps. But then, yes, as was pointed out by Tarek, uh, it's a matter of resource. Yes, uh, you need a lot of resources to sort of bridge that gap. But um, we are definitely uh, 
uh, in the finance ministry. This it is uh, definitely under consideration. We're also uh, waiting for the um, the result or the recommendations of the the Pay and Pension Commission, which has been formed, and uh, hopefully uh, in the next few months uh, we should be getting some recommendations from that Pay and Pension Commission. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting, especially the retirement committee, which because that's also something uh, you know which will probably put a little bit of accountability into how much work has been done by which individual. Um, we have so many questions, and I guess the interest is because every if, if this is like the staple drawing room conversation for all Pakistanis that the, the public sector needs to work harder, needs to reform, needs to be you know free of corruption and more accountable and all that stuff. So, but but we don't have much time. So probably one last question, and then we'll wind up. Um, uh, there's a question on that the rut sets in at the lower levels, like the 17th and the 18th levels, and most reforms that uh, uh, development partners or the governments intend to do, they do it at the higher level. You know, you need the higher ownership for that. So how do you make effective performance evaluations, Babsa, this is for you, at the lower level also? Because the minister and the secretary, yes, they sign the contracts, but how do you motivate or how do you let the lower level staff, like the uh, lower grades, work harder? You see, in the federal government, uh, where we have started this, as I said, uh, this is this is one of the elements of the performance management system. Ideally, um, and hopefully, uh, in the in the years to come, this will trickle down. The there has to be this key KPIs, key performance indicators, and we have to link. We we are actually moving towards linking. The key initiatives under the agreement with the key performance indicators, and then judging the 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 officers the down below to the section officers based on their performance as far as the 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 performance agreements are concerned. So yes, we are we have to go down below from uh, the secretary, and you see, ideally, what should happen is that the agreement that the the the, 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 the minister uh, signs with the prime minister. Similar agreements have to be signed between the minister and the secretary, and the secretary has to sign uh, uh, the, the the agreements with his with junior staff going down below to grade 17. Um, so th that's 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 the concept of the entire uh, performance management system. So hopefully, um, the entire the entire ministry uh, has to be part of the part of the agreement. It's not only the the secretary or the uh, or the minister that has to sort of perform it's 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 a concept of the whole division working towards a common end yeah that, that's interesting and thank you so much for your time thank you so much for the good work that you're doing thank you Tarek Saab for being brutally honest and brutally honest about the fact what your generation could not do so probably it's now up to us how we you know take it forward and better it thank you Annabel for the insights also for the time and investments that FCDO and a lot of development partners are making for uh, these such reforms because they're extremely important. And sometimes, yes, political leadership is important, but also support is important and the technical expertise is also important. Uh, I leave uh, with this comment from like all of you and just summarize with something that you talked about competence, but then more than competence, it has to be integrity. And then even more than integrity is also about, you know, having those kind of decision-making powers and decision-making abilities to be able to steer forward the public sector of Pakistan. Uh, I hope that with the work that is being done now, we'll have more happy news to share about Pakistani's public sector reforms. And we look forward to that. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for this insightful conversation.